Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get get started. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started um, with our grand rounds this morning, and our speakers don't really need an introduction, but I was assigned to be the moderator, so <laughs> um, we'll be hearing from Dr. Mifflin and Dr. Duffin about a uh, humanitarian trip they did in Bolivia. Thanks, Leah, and we're also going to hear from Claudia, Dr. Caballero from Bolivia. She is a third-year resident there, so we are delighted to have her here. Most of you have met her, I think, rotating on retina, and uh, we met her. I don't know if Dr. Duffin met her a few years ago, but I met her for the first time on our trip. So it's really a pleasure to have you here, Claudia. Uh, stand up so everybody can see who you are. She's going to give us a little... A little, uh, you know, a little talk as well. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of a taste of this. This is not comprehensive at all, but some of the challenges of kind of international corneal transplantation, the eye banking aspects, and this is really not going to give you any um, real solutions for that, but maybe raise some questions and maybe get some people interested and excited and hopefully some residents and fellows can be, you know, kind of uh, interested in this because I think there's a real opportunity to um, do good in the world in the area of uh, eye banking and corneal transplantation. So we, we took a trip to uh, Bolivia in August. Which one advances, Randy? There we go. I just wasn't hitting it hard enough. So my disclaimer is there may be true experts in the room, like Craig, uh, Mike Duffin, maybe others, but I am not one of them. In terms of you know humanitarian projects and things, that I, I don't claim to be an expert, but I do have some expertise in eye banking. Um, really, the heroes of corneal transplantation and donation are the donors, their families, but also eye bankers, you know, the people like Michael Ye and all his staff and, you know, many, many people around here who make this kind of stuff happen. And there's a lot of selfless service and hard work that goes into um, this gift. This is just a picture of the, I don't know if, if you guys haven't been down to the the main library, there's a really nice donor memorial called the Donor Wall. And it has names of donors etched in this beautiful glass memorial, and there's a park there. And if you haven't been there, I would encourage you to go visit it. It's really, it's really touching. So eye banking requires a lot of um, logistics, organization, regulation, certainly a lot of technical aspects. There are a lot of economic and social issues that go into kind of um, being successful in eye banking. And then there's the humanitarian aspect of providing the gift of tissue for those in need. And in our country, it's a well worked out process. The FDA and the eye bank Association of America regulate the process. There's a lot of self-regulation. Basically, the profession of eye banking, if you will, regulates itself. And it works very well. And the standards set by our association are kind of that we, we set up criteria to make it safe, basically. And those would include things about determining suitable donors, uh, the techniques, and the actual very, um, very detailed procedures that have to be followed to get a consistent product, if you will. And that would include things like storage and distribution as well. And some of the really important criteria, and, I, and you just kind of think about international donation as you're you know, thinking about developing countries. And in this country, we have things like driver's license registries, which have been incredibly successful in promoting donation. Most of you are probably donors, and you were asked when you went down to the DMV if you wanted to be a donor, and you clicked yes or, you know, check it on the form, and then it's something that can actually be tracked. If someone passes away, the first thing they do is check the driver's license registry, and 
you know, the, the family will be um, informed that, hey, your loved one wanted to be a donor and, you know, the, the process is rolling. But you can imagine how that may not be so easy in a developing country where you might not even really know the person's name, address, anything like that. So just kind of think of the international part of donation as, as you go through this. Um, once the person is kind of enters the donation process, a very detailed history needs to be taken, usually from the next of kin, but could be from a physician or somebody like that who knows the medical history to, tr to rule out communicable disease. Um, a physical assessment is done. There's blood work done basically to test for communicable diseases. And then the tissue needs to be evaluated to determine its suitability, usually just with a slit lamp exam and specular microscopy to look at the endothelium. And really the contraindications to transplant based on this history, uh, medical and social history, and also the tissue evaluation are to prevent communicable disease. That would really be the number one thing. And that would include infections, um, certain really scary things like rabies, which is, you know, pretty much fatal if you get that. Um, neurodegenerative disorders like uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, uh, mad cow disease, which are also really scary. Alzheimer's, which is an, kind of an unknown risk in donation. Um, actually, certain cancers, adenocarcinoma, retinoblastoma, have been transmitted via eye donation. Those are very rare. And surprisingly, infectious diseases like AIDS and hepatitis are really rarely transmitted, if any. The structural things that would determine success would, you know, in our country certainly would be previous LASIK or PRK surgery would be something that would have to be taken into account. Scarring, um, many times there could be uh, other criteria like lower cell counts or possible keratoconus, which would affect success. And then in our, the FDA requires us to test for these diseases, although pretty much everyone agrees that syphilis cannot be transmitted with corneal transplantation, but the FDA requires it, so, so we do it. Um, so again, kind of surprisingly maybe, HIV, there's no documented transmission, although certainly could have occurred. Um, hepatitis B has been uh, transmitted, hepatitis C, no proven transmission, but there are suspected cases. Prion disease has been transmitted. Um, there are certainly some cases of mad cow disease that are suspected. Um, I didn't put those in there. I'm just kind of dealing with U.S. statistics, but internationally there are some other things. And then malignancies, um, as I mentioned. One thing that's important, and you know, we're learning a lot of things about corneal donation, and in particular, there's always been a bias in this country of, to use younger tissue. One would think that a younger cornea is gonna probably have a longer survival, uh, better outcome, but that, that really has not been borne out in a well-designed study called the Corneal Donor Study, and that really the donor age at least kind of making the cutoff at age 65 and looking at donors less than 65, kind of 40 through 65-ish via, or versus older up to about 75, really didn't make a difference in outcomes. And then a current study, and uh, I've been lucky enough to be involved in both of these, is looking at the length of storage of corneas, which again, there's always been a bias in our um, you know, cornea surgeons, and certainly in the US, of, shorter storage times would be associated with better outcomes. But this is actually being studied prospectively in BSEC patients in this cornea preservation time study. <coughs> and the initial results are really, uh, with, with it one year into the study, is really showing no difference. Um, but obviously we need to finish the study. We're masked, but we can tell that so far the outcomes are the same. So this has actually really aided international donation because if U.S. surgeons don't use the tissue, then it's available for international use. And many international surgeons have really appreciated getting a cornea that's eight or nine days old and, and know that usually the outcomes are good. So in the developing world, corneal blindness is a huge problem. 
um, and often for different reasons, reasons than we have here. Um, certainly trachoma would be a leading cause of corneal blindness, other infections, trauma, um, xerophthalmia, vitamin A deficiency, that type of thing. So there's a great need for corneal transplant tissue in, in the developing world. And so the supply and demand is um, not, not a matched, uh, it's not matched in terms of, you know, the supply is very limited um, in developing countries because eye banking is not well established in most places. We do have um, surplus tissue in the United States and so a lot of tissue is actually exported for transplantation. Um, some, just some of the, you know, some of the challenges as you could think about as I went through all of those things would be, first of all, just getting people to be willing to donate and there will be cultural perhaps. Um, there really aren't a lot of religious um, barriers to donation, but there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, lack of knowledge, you know, ignorance isn't really the right word, but people just don't really understand the process and then there's certainly cultural barriers. And then just the logistics of it is probably the biggest barrier, trying to you know, kind of go through that process to make sure that the tissue is, um, is safe. But it's something that we need, to, we need to do. We need to try to improve this in the world. And so the Bolivia trip was um, basically, one of the things that we wanted to do is kind of work on helping with eye banking in Bolivia because right now they do not have an eye bank. So in our country, we have uh, a lot of willing donors and we have a surplus of tissue and so 22,000 corneas were, were exported for use in other, other countries, mostly developing countries. And um, I looked into our own eye bank statistics and found out that this year, 2013, we have had um, you know, roughly 760 corneas that were transplanted. Surprisingly to me, 40% of our overall volume were exported. Uh, I didn't think it would be that high. Um, many places are willing to reimburse us, although typically the reimbursement is lower, but this amount here does cover the hard costs for the eye bank. In other words, there's fixed costs associated with supplies, blood testing, things like that. So it's not necessarily a lose, uh, lose proposition in terms of the finances of it for the eye bank. But as you can see, there's probably some subsidization, subsidization um, with our domestic donors. And our eye bank, like most eye banks, is a not or nonprofit. We, we're looking for balance there. Um, this I also thought was interesting, and in again, thinking about the time to transplantation and the um, also the cell counts, because again, one would think, well, all of the bad tissue is going internationally, but our minimum criteria for transplantation is 2,000. So we can see that we're actually, our eye bank is exporting really good tissue and the average death to surgery is you know a little less than 10 days which is thought to be very acceptable and there certainly are barriers I mean customs would be the most common one you would ship it we recently had a tissue we shipped to China it sat in customs for six days it was too long it, you know the ice melted and the tissue was bad so so we our Bolivia trip was was great. We were able to, uh, through our eye bank, San Diego eye bank, and Vision Chair eye banks, have about 29 donor corneas, and we used 28 or 29 um, uh, transplants and lots of different diagnoses. One of the challenges that they have in Bolivia is getting good tissue. So there were a lot of failed transplants that we we operated on. Uh, really high incidence of keratoconus. I found somebody's dissertation where they looked at atopic disease in Bolivia and 20% of 13 and 14 year old kids had atopic disease. So 
So there's a lot of eye rubbing. There's some thought that the high altitude and, you know, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, you go there, uh, uh, keratoconus is just rampant and it's awful. Um, lots of uh, corneal edema, patients after cataract surgery. Uh, generally, the Bolivian um, population, they have kind of smaller eyes, so they're prone to glaucoma. Uh, so we had some patients that had, had corneal decompensation related to glaucoma uh, problems. And then trauma, corneal infections, things like that. Things that you would expect. Uh, the other, a couple other notable things is that we worked at the Eye Institute there, and I think Dr. Duffin and maybe Claudia are going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I was very impressed, not knowing what we would be, you know, what we were going to, what you know, what it was going to be like. Uh, the surgeons and certainly the residents and the staff you know, that we were working with were very well trained, very competent and technically there was not an issue in my opinion really in terms of the uh, challenges of corneal transplantation um, but the tissue is definitely a challenge for them I mean they were just amazed we had you know kind of leftover corneas from the US and like wow we have great tissue you know 2,000 cell count good stuff 10 days only 10 days old you know <laughs> wonderful um, the other thing is I think some of the, you know, different transplant techniques would also be very helpful in some of these countries. For example, doing anterior lamellar keratoplasty where the quality of the tissue doesn't seem to be quite as good. And we were able to do some, some early cases in, in Bolivia that, you know, may allow them to use, have a little broader use of the tissue that's available. And then I, maybe Dr. Duffin will talk a little bit about some groundwork that was laid for future eye banking. And then, of course, our educational exchange that we hope to continue with uh, the Institute here in La Paz. And Claudia can talk a little bit about that. And um, if you're interested in, you know, helping or getting involved, and certainly residents and fellows, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things that can be done um, to help inter international eye banking efforts and um, really could be something that could you could actually literally participate in. Uh, our eye bank is very excited about this. You can contact me or, or Wade. Um, I want to thank Wade, he's not here, but I want to thank him for helping me get some of the statistics for this. And that's it. Happy to briefly answer any questions if you have any. <laughs> Dr. Olson. Mr. Mark, obviously, <coughs> Thank you. 